Another area where political action should be brought to bear, another concern that I would wager very few of you have ever been informed of, even though you may subscribe to the better newspapers and magazines, is the importance of converting the world to a hydrogen economy. When people talk about the energy crisis, what they usually are saying is, well, we need to go to nuclear power, but it's so mutagenic and destructive and hard to control that it pollutes the atmosphere and screws up the food chain. That's bad. And then the nuclear engineers come forward and they say, well, did you know that if you replace nuclear power plants with coal-fired generation, that you will have to have so many coal-fired power plants that the natural radioactivity in coal will eventually be concomitant to the amount of energy released by nuclear? And then people say fusion. And they say, and if you will just give us another five trillion dollars, we think we can deliver fusion by 2030. This is obviously not a solution. Meanwhile, it is very well understood in the engineering community that sunlight gathered in space could be transmitted as microwave energy to, let's say, a, a remote island somewhere. And on this island, hydrogen could be cracked out of seawater. And the liquid natural gas transportation technology that is in place today to move liquid natural gas from Indonesia to its markets in Japan and Europe, that high pressurized, highly pressurized tanker technology could be used to move hydrogen to its markets. Well, when, when you use hydrogen as a fuel, you crack it out of seawater. When you burn it in an automobile or an electrical generating plant, it recombines with the oxygen that it was broken away from when it was cracked out of seawater. It turns back into water you have here a very low pollution fuel economy. And the other amazing thing about a hydrogen-based economy is uh, all machines that we possess today will work. You can convert automobiles, generating plants, uh, uh, steel smelting facilities, heavy industry. It could all run on hydrogen. Well, why is this not being explored and pushed? I, I, I don't understand. Is it because the investment in the standing crop of nuclear and coal-fired generating systems is so great that nobody wants to turn away? If that's what it is, then again, what we're pushed up against is profit. We can solve our problems, but it's not clear that we can solve our problems and get rich at the same time. And that is the current requirement for all solutions. Mm -hmm. If you come up with a solution to a problem that doesn't make money on the side, they say it is not a solution. This uh, means that the profit motive, they're saying, well, we could save the world if you'll show us a way to make money at it. <laughs> but if you can't show us a way to make money saving the world, then we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and let it slide. And apparently, uh, the, the wealthiest 5% of the human race will escape to a terraformed Mars or a colony at L5, and the rest of us will be just left down here to eat it. It's happening right now. The greenhouse effect, is at last being measured and commented upon in the boardrooms of the banks and international lending institutions, not because they love the earth, but because they see the uh, food production economy of the northern hemisphere going to hell. They see the Great Plains of America and Western China and the Soviet Union turning into deserts. That's their investment. They're now ready to talk reform. And uh, in the argument about is the world getting better or getting worse, uh, 
the main fact that is always put forward, and by myself, I might add, to argue that the world is getting better, is in the last couple of years there's been a phenomenal number of wars and conflicts negotiated to stalemate. Uh, the situation in Angola, Namibia, the situation in Iran, Iraq, the situation in Central America, the situation in Afghanistan. To some degree, each one of these situations has been slightly backed down from its previous high level of conflict. I believe this is not because decency and reason has broken out in the chancelleries of the world. It's because they're looking at data about the greenhouse effect and the dissolution of the ozone hole and what the data is telling them is war is as obsolete as putting armored men on horseback on the plain of gold. War is a luxury of ancient, over-wealthy societies. We can't afford war. That's why it's being legislated out of existence. A staggering amount of money is going to have to be spent to try and keep this planet from going nova. And, uh, you know, we may end up paying the Brazilian government $10 a throw to plant trees. I would favor that. I would rather pay the third world to plant trees, even if we spent billions of dollars on it, than to build up nuclear arsenals. That seems to me a much... To, to leave our children a reforested planet than to leave our children an ever larger arsenal of thermonuclear weapons seems completely reasonable to me. But, um, so my, my hope is that the word has finally trickled up to the top and that they are willing to talk Turkey. I think that the situation is going to get worse as a prelude to getting better. And that as psychedelic people who can only live on this planet for the foreseeable future, we, are, we need to network with each other and clarify our thinking on these issues so that when the crunch comes, we will not be scattered and demoralized and frightened. Because I think it lies not that far uh, in the future. So I just want to put these things out. You've never heard anything like this publicly from me before. And I'm not saying that we need to become burning-eyed fanatics and say, if this isn't done, then X, Y, and Z, which is terrible, will result. But I think we have a moral responsibility to articulate solutions, even though they may not be the ultimate solutions. Because if, if what these governments fear is the uh, turmoil from the world population when they try to implement vast global changes, I think we need to give these institutions the understanding and permission to realize that the great masses of people are far out in front of them because it's the great masses of people who feel the impact of these things. In the boardrooms of New York, the greenhouse effect is simply bad uh, data on return on capital investment. In Brazil and the Midwest, it means bankruptcy, lost farms, disrupted families, ruined lives, alcoholism, drug abuse, serial murder, the whole spectrum of effects that happens when people are asked to live in uh, intolerable social conditions. And, you know, one of the things that's always been at the back of my mind and sort of upsetting to me about the, the new wave of psychedelica and the old wave, as far as that's concerned, is it's awfully lily-white. I mean, it's really a honky party. <laughs> and uh, it shouldn't be that way because the world is not lily white. I mean, the world belongs to 25-year-old black women with three children and an average annual income of somewhere around $600. That is the average citizen of this planet today. Or maybe she's Chinese. 
but uh, if we take seriously the leadership position that our good fortune has laid upon us and the least fortunate among us in this room is more fortunate than 98% of the people on this planet. If we take seriously our position of privilege, then we have to begin articulating these kinds of programs. And I don't hear it being done. Uh, I don't want to talk about it very much, but I think this political campaign that's being run is infantile and insulting beyond belief. <laughs> and. Uh, I've knocked Michael Dukakis and had people come up to me afterwards and say, you shouldn't say that. This is going to be a very close election. You should, if you've got a criticism, wait till it's over with. We've got to get this guy in. Well, I, it's co-option as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what kind of a political uh, trap have we fallen into when the guy who is our best hope his wife was a pillhead for 25 years, and he never noticed. <laughs> and that's our last best hope. You know, that's the giant who will lead us out of the morass. <laughs> and I like the guy. I'm, I'm, but it just shows you, you know, what an appalling situation we are asked to put up with. And people care passionately that he win. I hate it that I care whether he wins or not, because I hate it that I have to even spend time thinking about whether I do or do not support such a clown. And yet the other side is so ghastly and so forth and so on. It's like an infinite regress into horror. Where, where are the people with ideas? Well, the answer is, probably half of them are in this room. <laughs> and, uh, and yet the ideas are good ideas. They're sound ideas. What this political campaign seems to be about is not saying anything about anything until it's over with. And then, of course, we're, and we who are asked to support Dukakis are told, don't make demands on him. Don't criticize him. Elect him. And when he's elected, you'll find out that he's really Tim Leary, Marshall McLuhan, and Mikhail Gorbachev all rolled into one. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So uh, I think that we shouldn't... It, it's almost like a, a coincidencia positorum. It's almost like a union of, of opposites. We must radicalize ourselves on the surface without changing our psychedelic transcendentalism, which is the source of our great strength personally. When, and in the 60s, what we always saw was uh, that power corrupted, and absolute power corrupted absolutely. I mean, I remember situations where you know, we would surge forward and stone the pigs and bust the windows. And then the leadership, which was usually, you know, these people who stammer, the leadership. <laughs> Hubert Humphrey said an amazing thing, the only amazing thing he ever said, as far as I could tell. He said, my enemies are people who stammer. <laughs> and I really had to laugh because I knew exactly what he meant because I had heard these little round-faced, fat boy, politicos, trots, and that sort of thing, uh, uh, say over, ag over and over again, now, 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 I want to make, I, 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 I just want to make one, one point. And, you know, that bit, they, their idea of a riot was you bust a few windows and overturn a police car, and then you return to party headquarters to talk strategy. And they would. And we would be left in the streets when the pigs swept in to bust heads. <laughs> so I, I, I agree with the Beatles who said, don't follow leaders, watch your parking meters. <laughs> in other words, you know, tend your own P's and Q's. But we need to articulate political solutions. And I think we need to be more critical of our own community. 
and I venture into this area with great trepidation because I don't want to be divisive, but I think after the article that uh, the Whole Life Monthly printed about my comments on crystals, my cover is probably blown. <laughs> but, you know, we are tremendously tolerant of infantilism. As a community, we're basically an anything-goes kind of crowd, and we're not into more uh, logical razors. Everything is as valid as everything else. It runs the whole gamut from, uh, you know, psychedelic research, groth breathing, that sort of thing, on into iridology, past life, channeling, so forth and so on. And again, an infinite regress that saps our energy and makes us politically impotent. I think we should insist on empowering transformation and then work out from the most politically implementable solutions toward these uh, more long-term questionable kinds of positions that have to be worked out over time. There's a great deal of pontification in the New Age and unquestioning acceptance and unquestioning uh, preaching of the weirdest stuff. I, I'm uh, amazed every time I go into one of these New Age environments at how little people value democratic ideals. People love to follow. Didn't they ever read John Stuart Mill? I'm afraid, don't answer that. <laughs> I mean, don't they understand what the American experiment is about? It's not about falling down on your face in front of some Bengali weasel who's leading you to some uh, totally interior vista that does not impact on the suffering of your brothers and sisters. That's not what it's about. The, the, the first psychedelic wave in America was the wave that created this country. I mean, that was a vision so powerful that even to this day, in China, in the Soviet Union, in Chile, in Uruguay, everybody gives lip service to those ideals. I'm not saying they practice it, but every country calls itself a democracy. Every country says it is giving its citizens more freedom. I mean, some countries say, now the way we're going to give you more freedom is by having three generals tell everybody what to do. But no country on earth proclaims, we're just power crazy bastards. And uh, <laughs> Listen, don't laugh, it's progress. In the 1930s, there were political philosophies where that was up front. The strong should rule. The weak should be ground under and destroyed. That is not a respectable political position anywhere on this planet. It may be clandestinely and overtly implemented in a number of places, but no politician can get up and give a speech about uh, the need to repress people and diminish their capacity for humanness. It's just not uh, in the mix 